So we thank you for this man of God, and I thank you for the word that you have placed within him to bring forth to be a blessing to us this morning. And we thank you that as he brings it forth, that you're blessing him. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The bishop couldn't be here, so you have to settle for me. Sorry. Just kidding. I can yell occasionally into the microphone if that will make you feel more like bishops here. <laughs> no? Challenges. Yes, I love the way he says it. All right. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, say, I brought it. If it's on your phone, say, it's on my phone. All right, that means you can be in the right translation that I'm using. All right, turn with me or uh, search with me, if you will, or scroll with me to Mark chapter 11. Are y'all blessed this morning? Every day. Every day. All right, Charles Barkley's in the house. Everyone's like, Erde, it's terrible. Erde. <clears throat> Mark chapter 11. The Gospel of Mark. Say amen when you're there. If you're not there yet, there's a screen with Scripture on it. You can follow up there. And I want you to start with me in verse 12. Liam, verse 12. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry, speaking of Jesus. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Now let's jump down to verse 20. And they passed in the morning, passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And we're going to stop right there. A lot of people misunderstand this story in the gospel. In fact, I've heard people use it as a reason to not be a Christian because they feel that Jesus' behavior in this passage is difficult to explain other than angry and petty. Why would you curse a tree that doesn't have fruit when the Scripture says it's also not time for it to have fruit? It's, it's quizzical, isn't it? Why would he do this? We're going to get into it today. But one of the things that I want to point out right from the start is the time of the year that we're in right now. It's the beginning of March. It's the season of Lent. We're moving headlong toward Resurrection Sunday, which takes place at the very end of this month. Depending upon how people worship, some of them have gone to Ash Wednesday. They're only eating fish right now, which has nothing to do with the Bible, but rather fishermen that needed to sell fish, and so the Pope started doing it. And anyways, we're not getting into a history lesson today. But if you've ever wondered, why fish? Yeah, it has nothing to do with the Bible. So here we are. We're in this season and I thought it was an important time to remember what's happening as we're approaching the time that Jesus is going to be betrayed and he's going to be turned over. A lot of times people talk about this, this passage of Scripture and they talk about it in a vacuum. And what is it that I always say? Context is so important, right? Context is important. We might be familiar with, oh yeah, Jesus got angry and cursed that fig tree once. But why and when? What was going on at this period of time? And so I want us to now back up, and I want us to start at the beginning of Matthew chapter or uh, Mark chapter 11. Because here's the point that everyone, everyone always takes these passages of Scripture, Pastor, and they preach them in sections, in like little chunks. Here's what happened, and then they move on, and then here's what happened, and then they moved on. But there's an important point that is being made by Mark here in this gospel that we need to pay attention to. Because did you realize here at the beginning of Mark is when it says in verse 1, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem to Bethphage 
And Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and we'll send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they said to them, what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus, and they threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest! And he entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is what we usually reserve for the Sunday before, right? The Sunday before Good Friday. This is Jesus' triumphal entry. Palm Sunday, we call it. And every single time this message is ever preached, that's about the extent of what's preached. His triumphal entry. Fulfilling prophecy. And I got to tell you, I love this passage of Scripture because I find it also quite odd. Let's put it in modern context. Jesus says to his disciples, hey, listen, we're in Castroville right now. We're going to be going into San Antonio a little bit later. I want you to go on ahead. I want you to find for me a nice, brand new 2024 Ford F-250, King Ranch Edition, fully loaded. It's got the steps that swing out just like Chris's truck does. Really, really nice. Brand new on the dealer lot, zero miles on it. No one's ever taken it off, okay? Disciples, I want you to go over to Red McCombs. I want you to say, uh, just go, go get the keys and go get the truck. And if they try to stop you, just say, the Lord has need of it, you know? In Texas, that might get you shot. I'm just, just letting you know. But this is what's going on. There's a cult tied, and this is fulfilling prophecy that he would ride in triumphantly into Jerusalem and that they would sing his praises and hail the coming kingdom. And they did just that. It's interesting to think that this is happening a week prior to when these same people would cry out for his crucifixion. But it's within this context See, people always get this confused because it says that he encounters this tree on his way to Jerusalem. He's gone to Jerusalem. He's gone to the temple. He's looked around, and he's thought, it's kind of late. We're going to leave. So he's left, and he's gone back out to Bethany. And so it's the next day. They're coming back to Jerusalem, and it says he hungered. Now, put in context, and this is why I... I I become aggravated. I'm sorry. I do when people look at this and they go, see, Jesus wasn't always all that in a bag of chips. Look, he had a temper. He cursed this tree for no reason. Context. Understand his character. What do we know? One thing about Jesus' character. He hungered. He hungered a lot. He hungered for food. He didn't have a place to lay his head. But he also hungered for the kingdom of God. And hunger for food was nothing that would cause him to curse a tree alone. In fact, we know that he was, went without food for 40 days and 40 nights as he was tempted. The devil says, turn these rocks into bread, and he refused to do so. So being hungry is not a big deal. But he's hungry, it says. And I think that's an important thing that Mark is pointing out because it's what leads him to go to this tree. And this tree is, is what? It's covered in what? It's covered in leaves. Now, it's this time of the year. It's this season. It's in the northern hemisphere. The, you know, their environment and weather's a little different from ours, but, you know, trees do what trees do. How many of your yards are covered in leaves right now? Because mine are covered in leaves. And, or, and weeds, too. When I was going to leave this morning in my truck, my neighbor was down the street, leaf blowing everything into the street. I'm like, great. I'm sure a good wind, and that'll be in my yard later on today. It's against the law. I'll tell him. He won't care. So it's this time of the year, the tree 
isn't expected to have leaves on it. It's not expected to have fruit on it either. That's what Mark is meaning when he says, and not this Mark, but the gospel of Mark, just saying. I don't know what Mark knows about fig trees. Do you know anything about fig trees? Okay. <laughs> so this is what Mark means when he says, it wasn't the time for figs, but it shouldn't have even had leaves on it either. So Jesus walks up to it when he sees it in leaf. Now, I didn't say in bloom. Do you know why? Little little thing about it. Do you know that uh, there's not, a fig tree is not a flowering plant before it has fruit because the fruit's actually the flower? Did anyone know that? Pretty cool, right? You're learning science today. Check that out. It's pollinated by a wasp. Did anyone know that? More science. Leslie's on it. She's like, I know all the horticulture. <laughs> So he walks up to it because it has the appearance that a fig tree would have to have fruit. Are you hearing me? Let me say that again. He walks up to the tree because it has the appearance that a tree should have if it's going to have fruit. You wouldn't expect figs on a barren tree, but you might expect figs on a tree with leaves. So he walks up to it looking for something to eat. He finds nothing, and he curses the tree. Now, let's read the next passage before they leave Jerusalem again. In verse 15, another favorite passage that people just kind of pull out as a chunk. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers." And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. This is one of my favorite Jesus going off passages, you know? It's like this is Jesus from the west side. You know what I'm talking about? I always remind everybody, it's like I'm saved, but I'm like, Saved, Jesus chasing people with a whip saved, okay? It's like, I am nice and calm and and gentle, and I will teach you, and then I will reach a point where I am throwing tables and chasing people out. Should we all be like that, you know? This is what's called righteous anger. God incarnate has come, and he has walked into the temple that has been built as a place for his presence, and what he is seeing is dirty commerce taking place of prayer and taking advantage of the poor, taking advantage of those who have come to worship. Let me explain what's going on. Now, this isn't in the scripture, but this is what most scholars believe was happening as a practice in the temple at that period of time. And by the way, it's interesting if you ever go look at what's happened with the temple, because the first temple of Solomon had really just kind of been torn asunder. It was in shambles. And Herod, the king, he comes and he creates this new temple, but the temple's kind of limited in size. It's not as big as the pagan temples are. And he really wants to look big and important like the Romans do. And so he builds these massive porticos, these porches, and expands this huge footprint of where the temple is. Now, this is not where Jesus is at this point. It's important to know that on this outer porch, Gentiles who believed and worshipped the God of Israel and women and children and men could be there. And then there was another court where the Gentiles had to stay behind. And then another court where only the men that were there. And then further in, it was only the priests. And so in this outer uh, court, away from where the priests are, but away from where the women and the Gentiles are, this is where the tithes are taking place. And this is where these money-changing tables are. So it's, it's kind of one of these inner courts in this grand kind of palatial temple that Herod has built. And really not as a monument to God, but really as a monument to himself. This is the, I want you to get a picture of what's going on with this, the lavish marble and gold spires. They're not there for God. They're there for the king, and they're there for the priests. And so these people are coming, and they're bringing their offerings. They're bringing their animals that they have taken out of their flocks, right? These animals that are without blemish, and they're bringing them, and the priests are saying, no, this isn't any good. You need to go over there and buy one of those pigeons, 
And they're like, okay. So I, to have my sins atoned as my offering to the Lord, I have to buy your church pigeon. Got it. Okay. My pigeon's not good enough. You ever been told that? I've been told that. Not pigeon, but you know what I mean. And so they go, and they, they go to buy this pigeon. Oh, sorry, Carlos, you can't use Roman money here. This is the temple, okay? You need temple currency. Remember when the Pharisees tried to trap Jesus? And they said, you know, where, where, where do we sow? You know, do we pay taxes? And he's like, priest, pull out a coin. What is the coin that the priest pulls out? A denarii, not temple currency. Oh, Pharisee, what are you doing with that? Well, give it to Caesar. It's Caesar's anyway, right? But what happens at the temple is a separate currency, right? A special currency, a set-apart currency. This money is, is pure. You're right, exactly. So you're going to bring your 50 bucks, right? Well, I'm not going to accept it, okay? But I'll tell you what, I've got $50 in temple currency, if you give me your $50, I'll give you this $50 in temple currency. And I promise you, the exchange rate's perfectly fine. There's nothing happening in my favor in this exchange of funds. You following? You following? So what they're doing is they're, they're doing this exchange and they're defrauding the people that have come to give their offering to the Lord by taking their Roman money because that's what they want. They don't care about the condition of the person's offering. They don't care about the type of money that they're spending. They just want to take it from their pocket and putting it into their pocket. That's what's happening. So Jesus comes in. Now, it says he'd been there the day before. He'd looked around. He'd seen what was going on in the temple. But he'd waited. It was late. He's come back with a purpose, Kim. He's come back with a purpose to drive out those who would seek to sully what's happening in the temple of God, who would use the place of God where people have come to worship, where people have come to seek forgiveness and atonement. He is driving those people out so that those who have come to worship in pure worship can be there. They've made a mockery of things. And when he does this, he says, this house is to be a house of prayer. You made it a den of thieves. That's why it was thievery. They were literally stealing. They were literally stealing from the people of God. Now, we've gotten more fancy with it over the years. Now, people have like television shows, and they'll send you handkerchiefs in order to defraud the people of God. Yeah, I'm going there. You know, we had a bookstore in here a long, long time ago, and pastor was convicted about it because we want in no way to have any sense of ill propriety in this church. She has always been so faithful with the finances that come in here to to make sure that a portion of these finances are going out to like the Church of Hope and River City Christian School and Bishop David to further the kingdom and the work of the gospel even outside of these four walls. It's not, it doesn't come in here to enrich us. And that's how it's supposed to be. There's a term, you know, there's a term called nonprofit. Do you know the NFL is a nonprofit? Yeah, I know everyone's faces. Yeah. The NFL is a nonprofit. Go look it up. Do you know the Kardashians have a church? Yeah, yeah. Oh, let me enlighten you this morning, shall I? The Kardashians have a church, a nonprofit, that they started out in California. Because obviously they are beacons of hope and the light of Christ. Good write off, brother. You know, there's a problem in the world today because as a church, we have gotten complacent about this fact that the Word of God is being used to shill things so that people can enrich their lives. Now, let me clarify. I have no problem with someone who is in ministry making a living doing that when they're devoting their life and time and energy, right? A worker is worth his reward, right? The priests, the Levites, they were 
took, were taken care of because they took care of the temple. There's a model for this, okay? That model doesn't include six different mansions. I'm sorry, Jesse Duplantis. You don't need the biggest house in Louisiana, okay? We have gotten complacent and allowed people to represent a gospel that is not the gospel, and when it was happening in that day, do you know that people that were seeing what was happening were turning away from the temple? They were turning away from the priests. They were complaining about the Pharisees because they knew, even if they didn't live for God all the time, even if they didn't follow the law as strictly as the Pharisees did, they could look and go, you guys are vipers. You are not living according to God's word because that's not what we're called to do. The world can see it. Go to social media sometime and do any kind of search about what's going on in the body of Christ, particularly here in America, and what you will see is constant complaints about preachers enriching themselves, getting up on stage, and wearing thousands of dollars worth of sneakers and, sh and jackets and shirts. These boots are $340, okay, just to be perfectly clear. And I also don't take a salary from the church, and it was the most expensive pairs of shoes I've ever purchased in my entire life, Okay. I've also had this polo shirt for about 15 years. These jeans are fairly new, and this belt was 50 bucks. Okay, so there you go. I will also say this. I, just full transparency, I will say this. As I stand up here, we are in a blessed country. We are in the United States of America, and compared to many people, we live a very wealthy life, and I'm aware of that. There are people that have greater need than I do, and I'm blessed. And even while we are here in our smallest church trying to faithfully serve God, I'm, and, I, and I call out people that wear $4,000 pants and sneakers and stuff while they preach the gospel, I'm also aware that I have a lot of very expensive equipment behind me that I use to serve the Lord that the church didn't buy. And that thankfully I work for a music store so I get a really good discount. But I'm aware of these things, and there's this struggle, okay? We want to serve God. We want to do things with excellence. But that excuse has been used to create a den of thieves in churches across this country, on Christian channels everywhere, where the, the gospel being preached is just an excuse for a telethon. Okay, I'm going to step off that soapbox now. I think I've made my point clear. Thank you. Now, in that context... That was happening in the temple then and is happening in the church now. Let's think of the fig tree that has no fruit. That's the point. What happens with this tree does not happen in a vacuum. It happens in this context. Jesus has ridden in, triumphant, fulfilling prophecy. The Messiah is here. People are declaring the coming kingdom. And when he goes to the temple, by the way, those weren't the people shouting his praise. It wasn't the priests and the Pharisees shouting his praise. He goes there and he looks around and he sees the devastating truth of what's going on that they are using God for greed. And the temple looks like the place where God would be. And the priests are adorned, and they look like men of God. And everything that's happening with the ceremonies look like the thing that's bringing atonement. but there's no fruit. Are you hearing me this morning? We look around at our society, at the world that we live in. We often complain, sometimes feeling like there's no hope. Have you ever looked around at the things that are going on and go, dear God, this world's going to hell in a handbasket, to use an old colloquialism. And it's true. Do you know why? Because the church has leaves and no fruit. And I'm talking about the church at large. You know, there are, there are ministries that are doing it right. 
There are, there are large churches here in San Antonio that are doing it right. There are large churches that have a huge portion of their funds come in, and they send it out. They help women who are pregnant and thinking about abortion. Please don't abort that child. We have a couple right here that will adopt it. We're not going to tell you, hope for adoption, give it. No, we have a solution for you, okay? There are churches that are baptizing people on the regular. There are churches that are preaching the gospel. But there are also churches that are not. There are churches where every pastor is going to get up there and he's going to give you a series of sermons, and that series of sermons just happens to tie into his new book. Oh, now guess what? You don't have to buy it. The church already bought 15,000 copies, so it could end up on New York Times bestseller list. Sorry, I'm meddling. I'm just telling you how the world works today, people, okay? You're like, wow, how do all these pastors have bestsellers? Well, it just happened to be that their, their church bought 150,000 copies of the book. First week, wow, that'll put it number one bestseller first week out. Sobering truth, isn't it? <laughs> so we, we as a church, here's the thing, we can call out congregations, and I, can, I could get, come up here and I could give you name after name after name after name after name after name of people that I have a problem with that stand behind pulpits or have television shows, okay? I'm not going to do that because you know what? We are the church. The church is not a building, the church is not a service. The church is not what happens here at Expect a Miracle on Sunday morning. You are the church. And the church down the street, they are the church. And the church across town that believes a little bit different or worships a little bit different than we do, they are the church. And the church on the north side that has tons of resources and lots of money, they are the church. And the church on the south side that's struggling and just trying to deliver to, uh, food to people in need, they are the church. In River City Christian School, they are the church. All of this is the church. And so we have, to not st- we have to stop looking at everybody. You know, I know there's accounts on Instagram like preachers and sneakers. If you wanted to be entertained or understand what I'm talking about, go check it out. But at the end of the day, we have to look inward. Are we trees that have leaves but no fruit? Now, context is important. Let's just, just go a little bit further because I want you to understand This is what's happened in kind of the action of things. We've seen Jesus has driven these people out violently from the temple. And he has declared, this is to be a house of prayer. This place is supposed to be about seeking and serving God, not commerce. And so now they've left. In verse 20, as we read before, as they passed in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots, And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you curse has withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt it in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And whatever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your father also who is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. This is also preached in its little nugget context so much, but this is what's going on in all of it. In the context of the triumphal entry, in the context of the withered tree, in the context of driving out the money changers, this is when Jesus says to you, if you will pray and believe, nothing is impossible. That's the point. They were in there. You know, it must have been ridiculous from his context. Jesus is God in the flesh. He has been for eternity. Through him, galaxies, planets, our entire universe came into being. And in the place where the presence of that God is to come and rest, these people are worried instead about trying to, to cheat the people of God out of some money. How ridiculous. How ridiculous is that? 
If you have want of need, ask your Father who is in heaven, and he will give it to you. (laughs) It's in that context that he looks around. And so this is why I so often look at what's going on in the church, and I go, really? Really? If we believe, if we truly believe who we serve, if we have want of anything, wouldn't we cry out to our Father? He's a good Father. He says, what father would deny their child bread? How much better is our heavenly father to give you what he knows you need? If we have that kind of prayer, the mountains become plains. There's nothing that is in our way. Let's, let's let go of these fleshly thoughts and desires and practices. Let's seek to be introspective of our own lives. We're going to turn real quick to 2 Timothy because Paul writes to Timothy and he warns him of this kind of behavior. Oh, there it is. Go to 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3. Am I just preaching up a storm or is it hot in here? 2 Timothy chapter 3. You know what? We're just going to start. I I told uh, Liam verse 5, but I'm just going to start at the beginning of the chapter because it's important, the context. Understand this, that in the last days there will come times for difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable. You know anyone unappeasable? It's never good enough. Nothing's never en- enough. Slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people, for among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Having a form of godliness but denying that power is the tree with leaves and no fruit. There are too many of us on a regular basis. We have identified our lives. We have, we have prayed a prayer. We have turned over our hearts to God. We're like, I want to serve you, but something happens. The, the cares of this world come in and they choke the fruit away. Jesus talked about this in the parable of the sower. Some of those seeds found good soil, but some of these seeds, the word, some of these seeds, they, they, it falls in this place and there's thorns, and the thorns grow with the vines, and they prevent it. They choke it out. They steal the nourishment away. What's the nourishment? The nourishment is the Word of God, and what has happened too often is those thorns, which Jesus clarifies to his disciples, are the cares of this world. They come in and they steal away your time. They steal away your passion. They steal away your your time when you go to pray. They steal away your time when you go to read the Word and to study. They steal away everything that when you're reading, suddenly you're like, wait, what was I reading? I I, I don't remember what I was reading because I was thinking about this other thing. Let me go back and read what I was reading. Or worse yet, you know what? I'm just distracted. I'll come back to this later. And then you never do. These things are real. This is practical. This is deadly practical. This is where the rubber hits the road. This is what happens in our lives. If we are not careful, we find ourselves surrounded by thorns, these cares of the world, and it distracts us and it lulls us into this complacency, this satanic lullaby where we're fine and we're happy as long as we're surrounded with our stuff and things seem okay. But the minute, the minute anything goes wrong, we suddenly realize what truth, that the stuff doesn't matter. And none of it makes us happy. And we're devoid of what we really need, which is God in our lives. And so we return to God and we get on our knees and we cry out and we ask him to come. And he comes and he manifests his presence and he touches us and he visits us. And we get back into it and we pray and we start reading and we study until things are okay. And 
then I need that to make me happy. I need that to make me happy. I need that to make me happy. I heard something the other day that I thought was profound. You got to catch it. It's a little difficult, but I want you to consider this. For many of you, this is true of me, okay? So I'm going to tell on myself. I want you to think about this. For many of you, you are now where you thought you'd be happy when you got there. You hear me? I think about my life, and I try to practice gratitude. Because I was talking to somebody about this the other day. I remember I just had to get new tires on my truck. We're not going to talk about how expensive it was. It was a lot. Tires are important. I never skimp on it, and it was due. I walked out last Saturday, flat tires. Like, great. I guess I know what I'm doing this Saturday. But I was talking to somebody yesterday about it, and I said, I remember when I couldn't pay for tires. I remember when something like that would have just, like, bankrupted me at that moment because I, ha- I didn't have the money. I remember we had a, a, this old car. It's a Mercury mistake, Mystique, sorry. And um, <laughs> true story. And uh, I remember I was feeling the tire one day, and I could feel the steel. That's how bald the tire was. And Candy and I were young, young married couple, and I didn't have the money to pay for tires. And I'm looking at this tire that's not just bald on one side, but literally has exposed steel. It's, it's deadly to be driving around like this. And I'm thinking to myself, what, what am I going to do? I remember pulling my wallet open at times and just praying, God, fill it with money because I have none. And I'm not in that place anymore. And I thank God that I'm not in that place anymore. But I remember being in that place and thinking, well, once this has happened or I get to do that or the other, well, then I will have arrived and I will be happy and things will be great. And then you find yourself there and you go, you realize that that's not at all what brings contentment or happiness or anything. And none of that is actually the lasting fruit that we're called to bear. Everything that we produce in our lives outside of the things of the kingdom of God, people, are leaves. Let me say that again. Everything that we produce in our lives outside of the kingdom of God are leaves. They're important. They're important. But we have to have fruit. We have to have fruit in our lives. So what is fruit? What does that fruit look like? We have the fruit of the Spirit. It's the opposite of everything that Paul just warned Timothy about. Are you patient? Are you kind? Are you loving? Are you gracious? Are you giving? Do you model the Word of God in your life? Do people see your life and know, without you having to tell them, who you serve? Can they look at you in contrast to the people that call themselves Christians that I called out earlier and see that what you are doing is serving the Lord and what they are doing is serving themselves and they can go, that's Christianity, that's faith, that's the gospel, that's what Jesus is about. It's how Leslie lives or it's how Kim lives or it's how Mark lives. When you're in the... the, the moment of despair? Do people see the faith in you? And when things are great and going great in your life, do people see that you're still in this? Not because you told them, not because you posted it on Instagram, but because it's apparent in your life. We often think of, in the church, follow me on this, we often think of fruit as evangelism, okay? But I want you to remember the context of what's happening here with the fig tree and the temple. The temple wasn't going to go out and evangelize to Gentiles. 
They weren't. They were there to serve God. Fruit is not evangelism. Fruit is not you sharing your faith and leading people to salvation. Fruit is not even you sow the seed and someone else reaps like we talked about when I preached last. That's not your fruit. That's God's fruit. Your fruit is to serve God and to exude the Holy Spirit in your life. And then that stuff happens. I want to say that again. Your fruit is to worship the Lord and to pray, to be in His Word, not to read your Bible, to be in His Word and to live a life for God. And if you do that, then the things that we are concerned about from an evangelical standpoint or an evan- evangelism standpoint will take care of themselves. Because when you are alive in Christ, you can't help it. You can't help but speak the truth into somebody's life. And it doesn't matter if they're sitting across from you and they're a good friend, and they're like, listen, I'm an atheist. Like, great, God loves you. (laughs) You know, and you don't even have to have this huge conversation. It's going to come out of you. What you put into you will come out of you. That is the fruit that you will bear. So that's what we need. That's what we need. We need each and every one of us to live like Christ has called us to live, to model Christ in everything we do, to be filled with his spirit and to not just look like it, but have that power that Paul's talking about. Not religion, but power, faith, love. If you do those things, then you will be fruitful. You won't just have the leaves, but the figs will be present. And when someone hungers, when someone hungers and comes to you, you will have something for them. Amen? Let's give the Lord praise. Amen. Amen. If this word has touched your heart, those who are watching live or at some future date, then I pray that you would get into the word that we have just gone through in Mark 11 and really meditate on it. And if you have not given your life to the Lord, he is beckoning you to him. He is beckoning you to cry out to him, to ask for forgiveness and invite him into your heart as your Lord of your life, and then he will be your Savior for all of eternity. If this is the first time that you have found us, make sure that you subscribe to our channel and follow us. And we'd love to see you in person, if at all possible. But comment and let us know how the Lord has touched your life. God bless.